extremely exciting. Uh, it's so delightful to, uh, for the first time in two and a half years or so, to be able to sit here together in the, in, uh, the same room with everyone and uh, do an academic uh, event. Um, and in particular, to have uh, our guest, Dr. Bono, who uh, Laura will introduce in a minute, um, who's really one of uh, my uh, greatest mentors and teachers, uh, spent uh, over 20 some years uh, working uh, with him uh, at Northwestern. So I'm really, uh, really excited about today's program. So just uh, since most of you uh, have, are joining us for the first time for the uh, Pioneers in Cardiology program, uh, this is a program that we started uh, several years ago. Um, this was uh, supported by funds that were generously donated by the uh, Daniel and Hetty Whitebrook um, Fund and family. Uh, so their gift was able to create this uh, Pioneer in Cardiology lecture series. Um, and, um, you know, we're really delighted to be able to, uh, to use these funds to bring world-class cardiologists, researchers, and professors, uh, to our, uh, UM Miller School of Medicine, uh, to discuss their innovations and, um, their contributions to the field of cardiology. So, uh, with no further ado, I'll call on, uh, our incoming uh, chief fellow, one of our incoming chief fellows, Laura McDermott, uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Bono. Thank you, Dr. Goldberger. So it's my honor to present Dr. Robert Bono. He is the Goldberg Distinguished Professor of Cardiology at Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine. He initially received his MD from UPenn and continued his fellowship uh, training at the NIH, where he eventually became the senior investigator in the cardiology branch at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute at the NIH from 1980 to 1992. He subsequently went on to become Chief of Division of Cardiology at Northwestern University from 1992 to 2000, 2011. Over the course of his long, illustrious career, he has co-authored and authored over 630 papers in the medical literature in 120 book chapters. He is currently Editor-in-Chief of JAMA Cardiology and is one of the editors of Braunwald's Textbook of Cardiovascular Medicine. Along the way, he has also served as President of the American Heart Association, as well as a Master of the American College of Cardiology and a Master of the American College of Physicians. He has served on the Board of Scientific Counselors and Board of Extramural uh, Advisors of the NHLBI the Board of Trustees of the American College of Cardiology, and the Board of Directors at the AHA, and the Subspecialty Board on Cardiovascular Disease at uh, the ABIM as well. Among his honors are the NIH Director's Award and the U.S. Public Health Service Commendation Medal and Outstanding Service Medal. He is the recipient of the Distinguished Leadership Award, Distinguished Achievement Award, Gold Heart Award, and James B. Herrick Award of the AHA, the Distinguished Fellowship Award, Distinguished, Distinguished Service Award, and Distinguished Scientist Award of the American College of Cardiology, the Den Denelin Award of the European Society of Cardiology, and the John Phillips Memorial Award of the American College of Physicians. He has also, um, and in, he has also been um, awarded an endowed chair in, in his name at Northwestern University in 2012. Dr. Bono, we are honored to have you here as our guest speaker for the Pioneers in Cardiology Lecture Series, and I'll wrap up so you can begin your lecture. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Dr. McDermott. Um, Laura and I actually had some time together uh, by phone. It's good to see you face to face and it's good to see all of you face to face. This is a new experience for me over the last couple of years as well. Um, and so uh, I'm glad that we're finally moving toward normalcy, not quite there yet, but uh, moving in the right direction. Uh, when Dr. Goldberger uh, invited me to be one of the pioneers in cardiology, my first impression was uh, does this mean I'm sunsetting, uh, you know, am I going to retire? He pointed out that Dr. Brownwald was the first one. So now I feel better because uh, Dr. Brownwald is still in the saddle and, and I intend to be also. So uh, we had to choose a topic different than my topic tomorrow, which I guess is the real pioneer lecture at Cardiology Grand Rounds. Um, and so we, we chose another one, which has some of the same kind of uh, feel to it as the one tomorrow. It's kind of about how you uh, mentor and how the, men the mentee actually mentors the mentor as well. 
that's kind of how this evolved for me, this whole issue of myocardial viability and how that plays into or doesn't play into uh, indications for revascularization. Um, so that's kind of my disclosure. Uh, otherwise, I have no relationships to disclose. Um, so um, a longtime colleague of mine and, and Dr. Wilberg, for that matter as well, Dr. Wilberg will recall uh, Mihai Georgiati, who tragically passed away about five years ago. Uh, he and I spent years together and he was a true mentor. He turned medical students and residents into a true academic cardiologists. Uh, he and I uh, and others had a paper in uh, circulation 2006, just looking at 24 consecutive heart failure trials in the New England Journal of Medicine. And all, all you had to do was go to table one, jot down who, who had coronary disease and who didn't. And of course that may have been adjudicated well or, or not in some trials. So in these clinical trials uh, of all these uh, different therapies for heart failure, um, as you see, almost two thirds of the patients had underlying ischemic cardiomyopathy. And so uh, that's uh, obviously a signal that this is a, a huge deal in heart failure. But you could argue that clinical trials are a little bit um, different than the real world. You know, who, what are your selection criteria? Uh, are you excluding patients who had a recent myocardial infarction? You know, things like that. Uh, so some uh, real, realer world data come from Greg Fonero. Uh, in uh, around the same period of time, in um, the ADHERE registry of uh, patients with heart failure across the United States in not only academic medical centers, but even community medical centers. And if you look at those who have uh, HEF-REF, low ejection fractions, one finds the same figure, 63% have underlying coronary disease. So that plays out also when you start talking about outcomes in patients with heart failure. Uh, here's some data from Felker and coworkers. You could choose lots of papers, which would show you curves like this, that if patients have LV dysfunction, uh, those with uh, underlying coronary disease have a worse outcome. They're at risk for future ischemic events, ventricular arrhythmias, uh, as well as heart failure events. And so uh, one sees a worse outcome in the individuals with heart failure in this uh, large study from, from the Duke database. And so at uh, one year, uh, these are the data, and at uh, five years, same thing, about 50% greater mortality. But remember now that two thirds of the patients here have coronary disease and they have a worse mortality. So we do the quick math on this. 74% uh, of the mortality is accounted for by uh, uh, heart failure related to coronary disease. Now th this is different depending upon uh, how generalizable your population is. Because we know that uh, black Americans, for example, have a much bigger hit related to hypertension than coronary disease and heart failure. But at least these are the data we're seeing. So bottom line, coronary disease, heart failure, a bad outcome. Um, and so um, uh, LV dysfunction is an important issue for our patients with CAD, but it's not always irreversible. And I'll, I'll get into a few minutes how I got engaged in this. It was, it was actually, uh, or I forget whether he was a medical student or a medical resident, we, we discussed him, but we'll talk about him. Come on, I was going my own ways at the NIH uh, in, in my own areas of clinical investigation. I got, in, got engaged in this one through a very bright uh, uh, trainee, if you will. Uh, so it's not always irreversible. Uh, here's a patient that we studied uh, in, uh, at Northwestern when we were doing MRI, uh, uh, Deepan Shaw, one of our fellows who's now at uh, uh, Houston at the Methodist Hospital, uh, studied a series of patients like this. So this is a uh, individual who clearly has LV dysfunction. I think you'd all agree. He's got anterior uh, wall thinning, apical dyskinesia, uh, really bad looking uh, LV. Uh, but when the patient gets revascularized and comes back, uh, not only has LV systolic function improved, uh, wall thickening has improved, and even wall thickness has improved. And so there used to be data out there that if there's a certain degree of wall thinning, it's got to be irreversible. It must be shoe leather scar. Not always. And so there can be substantial improvement in LB function, which I think you, we would all accept in the current era. Uh, back in the 1980s, when we started getting into these studies, that was less clear of how frequently one would see that. Um, but it, you see it quite frequently. And so uh, on the left are data that I put together with Dr. Vaskin Dulcisian, who was that really bright medical student slash resident from Georgetown who wanted a summer research project and started working with me. And uh, 
it wasn't clear whether uh, uh, a person of that uh, generation and uh, degree of uh, education and uh, interest was really interested in research or not, but he actually was the real thing. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So he and I just looked at a series of patients on the left who underwent revascularization of LV dysfunction. And you see that there's a significant increase in uh, uh, overall ejection fraction for the group. It's not uniform. Some patients do not improve, but about uh, one third of the patients have a 10% or greater improvement in ejection fraction. And on the right are data from Yale by Eleftardis and coworkers, where it's even more striking. Uh, here they're finding that about 40% of the patients have a substantial improvement. And, you, and as you can see, some patients normalize their LV function as well after revascularization. And so uh, this, this led uh, uh, 30 or 40 years ago, and now into the current era, with lots of studies trying to identify who these patients are, who have potentially re reversible LV dysfunction, whether you want to call it hibernation or repetitive stunning. Um, how do we identify those patients? Um, so it's, it's, uh, uh, imaging has come along to identify and tend to predict which patients have the uh, ability for improvement in function and perhaps use that as a selection criteria for cabbage. Um, you could use SPECT to assess membrane integrity. Uh, you could use dobutamine echo to assess contractile reserve or PET imaging to assess myocardial metabolism, uh, low flow, but metabolically active myocardium, or you could now use cardiac MRI to assess myocardial fibrosis. Now these have come along in different stages. Uh, SPECT obviously was the first kid on the block, but PET was really the, uh, the uh, imaging modality du jour in the, in the 80s and early 90s. Um, the Bidumin Echo then started picking up. And then more recently, of course, cardiac MRI is here. So I've had the opportunity to get involved in all four of these uh, areas of, uh, of imaging interest. And uh, I think the bottom line is they all work. And you, you kind of choose your modality to meet your match your patients and also to match the expertise of the center in which you're doing the imaging. Um, but what we did here uh, was uh, getting back to Dr. Dulcizian. Uh, he went on to be a fellow at the MGH. Uh, he's now uh, chief of nuclear medicine, board certified cardiologist, is also board certified in nuclear medicine at the University of Maryland. Uh, he came back from the MGH and wanted a job with me at, in Bethesda. And he had this idea that, you know, uh, we're seeing a lot of reversible uh, LB dysfunction. And if PET imaging is useful because there's metabolic activity, well, they, there must be myocardial membranes that are still viable and still behaving normally that would suck up cations like potassium or thallium. And so since thallium and potassium also, also work the same way through a sodium potassium ATPase, you got intact cell membranes, thallium want to work too. We just got to tweak the uh, way we're doing thallium imaging. And so uh, uh, Vaskin uh, uh, convinced me that we should be doing more than just injecting thallium and getting pictures. Let's you know, look for redistribution or even reinjection. Uh, we then compared it to a PET imaging in, in a series of patients uh, where the FDG image on the left and a reinjection thallium imaging on the right showing pretty similar uh, images that can be semi-quantitated as well. And then um, when I moved to uh, Northwestern, um, uh, Jeff will remember Fran Clocky uh, helped, helped create in the Research Institute a, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a research area where we weren't really competing with the radiologists, we're actually working with them for a change and, and actually had a nice research group. And since uh, viability was a protocol we already had in mind, we started seeing what we could gain by using MRI and patients who are already getting SPECT imaging at the butamine echo. And that led to the whole concept that perhaps one could identify non-viable myocardium with uh, late gadolinium enhancement. And so I still remember sitting around the table with uh, Kim and Judd, who are now at Duke, with uh, Dr. Clocky, and uh, saying, well, maybe that white stuff is the non-viable myocardium. Maybe that's a scar tissue. And so each of these modalities, if you, if you play them out, can predict which patients and which, which segments of myocardium in patients is likely to improve after you revascularize. So I'm not gonna belabor that point. I think that's pretty well known. Um, and um, but it was just an example of how, you know, a, a mentee came along and kind of trained the mentor to get into a different uh, uh, area of interest and start jumping through some different hoops.
and it was it was quite a good ride along the way. And Baskin and I are still friends. So for some re- some reasons, well, it's us. He, he's not quite the same friend he used to be because then we did a clinical trial showing that maybe it doesn't work. So we'll, we'll, we'll get there in terms of patient outcomes, whether survival uh, matters or not. That'll be the, the kind of the concluding aspect of this. And so we have these four um, modalities that could identify patients that will show an improvement in function. The question is whether that also translates into improved survival or not. You know, if you have a low ejection fraction and you improve ejection fraction, does that lead to a better outcome? One would hypothesize that it would. Uh, the question is whether it does. And so uh, 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 in the 90s, uh, early 2000s, there were a series of meta-analyses of the existing data that were out there uh, using uh, the tools we just discussed, um, PET, SPECT, dobutamine ECHO. These are all pre-MRI data. Uh, this one is often quoted. It's from uh, Kevin Allman, um, Leslie Shaw, and Jim Udelson where they uh, did something very simple. They did a meta-analysis of 24 studies of patients with LB dysfunction, ejection fraction, mean here of 33%. On the left are those that were deemed to have viable myocardium, and on the right, those who had non-viable myocardium. And um, one sees that uh, the, this is the uh, mortality rate per year was significantly lowered if you had viable myocardium and got revascularized compared to getting medical therapy. Um, uh, we'll, we'll come back to this one. I mean, this 16% annual mortality in patients with heart failure, I, we don't necessarily accept that in the current era with uh, GDMT. Uh, uh, and so that's one of the issues um, in this meta-analysis. The other issues, of course, are that uh, the modalities were different, that the thresholds for considering viability were different across these studies. None of them are randomized trials. They were retrospective studies. And um, uh, some mostly single, single center studies for that matter as well. And so you could e- even argue, should you, you do a meta-analysis with data not quite so clean as that? Um, but this was a significant finding. Um, but if you look at the right, uh, there was no significant difference. Um, now, a surgeon would come along quite appropriately and look at data like that and say, well, look, you know, if I revascularize the patient, um, uh, I don't hurt them if they're non-viable myocardium, and I help them if they've got viable myocardium, let's just revascularize everybody. That wouldn't be an incorrect way to look at data like that. Uh, this meta-analysis is comparable to another meta-analysis by Schinkel and co-workers and another meta-analysis by Kamichi and co-workers. In fact, in the Kamichi meta-analysis, both groups, viable and non-viable, to be doing better with revascularization. So this kind of sets up the equipoise uh, for why we did a stitch trial. Because uh, there's limitations of all those retrospective cohort studies. They, they are retrospective. Uh, they have heterogeneous methodology. Decision for cabbage could have been influenced by the results of the imaging data. Um, they weren't really well adjusted for key baseline variables like key, like uh, age and comorbidities. That's why a large database that's randomized would be helpful. And most importantly, the uh, cohort studies here were carried out before modern aggressive medical therapy. Um, In fact, if you go into some of those 24 or so studies and you try to figure out what the medical therapy was, it's not even identified in some of those uh, retrospective studies. The patients were treated medically without telling you how that was done. Um, And um, if you do look at the uh, data where the medical therapy is identified, it wasn't beta blockers for the most part or ACE inhibitors necessarily either. And uh, we know that medical therapy also improves LB function in patients with uh, uh, chronic ischemic myocardium, let's call it hibernation, especially beta blocker therapy. Um, And so we know that beta blockers can improve ejection fraction in patients with ischemic heart failure. And if it does, it's not making the scar contract better, it's making the viable myocardium contract more normally. And so there have been studies with SPECT and also with contrast CMR and also with the butamine echo showing just that, that before and after beta blocker therapy, the areas identified as being viable will also improve uh, in function. Um, and so that kind of uh, does set up the equipoise for the stitch trial. So this is um, uh, my uh, one venture with the uh, Duke uh, 
a clinical research institute, uh, uh, really well run. Uh, when we start looking at the data, you know, they have 98% accountability for all patients at 10 years. It was really a well-run trial. It was the only trial to look at um, uh, whether one should revascularize patients with an injection fraction less than 35%, because all of the previous cabbage versus medical therapy trials uh, were either patients with normal EFs or only mildly decreased EFs. There was no data in a randomized trial of patients with ejection fraction of less than 35%. So that was the aegis of the STITCH trial, was just to see whether revascularization improves outcome. Um, this was first published in 2011. Uh, it's 1,212 patients, 98 sites across the Europe, Asia, and North America, where all-cause mortality was the main endpoint, but cardiovascular mortality was also a secondary endpoint. Uh, at five years, when this got published, this was a negative trial. Um, and when it got extended to 10 years, it became a positive trial. Um, the interesting thing there, which I'm not going to get into, is that the overall hazard ratio budged by about 1%. But now they had longer longer term outcome, and so it's a longer term outcome, longer follow up. Uh, the hazard ratio itself didn't change much, but it became significant. Um, and so this was then became a positive trial. Uh, so the status of ten years was ascertained in ninety eight percent of patients, which is a very well well run uh, clinical trial. No missing data, no loss of follow up. They had they had the data on virtually everybody, and this was the um, outcome at uh, at ten years. And so um, those of us interested in the viability argument and the uh, question about whether viability would help you further stratify these individuals uh, uh, was uh, there. And that's why it was built in as a pre-specified substudy uh, of this trial. Uh, the, so we had a viability substudy. Uh, it was initially designed that all 1,212 patients would get a viability test, uh, but this was a, uh, a difficult thing for patients, you know, being randomized to surgery versus non-surgery in many institutions around the world. Um, and so there were some enrollment issues. And so um, although it could have been the perfect trial if all 1,212 individuals had a viability test, we got a viability test in 50%, which immediately sets up the issue of who did, who didn't get the test. Is there some bias built into this? Absolutely appropriate concerns. Um, and we have the same endpoints as the uh, 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 parent trial. Uh, this also had a 10-year follow-up uh, published uh, also in the New England Journal of Medicine, again, with excellent ascertainment. And uh, what we found was that, uh, at least in the setting of this trial, um, there wasn't much of a signal there regarding whether or not patients had viable myocardium or not. Now, <clears throat> the um, issue here, of course, is every patient's alive. Every patient has viable myocardium because they have a heart that's beating. How do you set a threshold for what's viable versus non-viable? So that's one of the issues which I'll come back to because we had to set a, a kind of a dichotomous um, um, definition of what was viable and non-viable. And we had both spec data and the vitamin echo data, and we had searched the literature for what would be deemed to be an appropriate amount of viable myocardium that should lead to a, an improvement in, in the ejection fraction. And would that lead to an improvement in outcome? I'll show you later on when you look at this as a continuum as opposed to a dichotomous relationship. But uh, getting back to the point here, uh, there was no real signal here of a better outcome, perhaps a trend in the group with viability on the right, but that was not significant. The actual data are shown here. And so you could argue that the group with viability is starting to look significant if you go down to the, uh, the hazard ratios and the confidence intervals. But what's important in clinical trials, you also look at the uh, interaction p-value, which was point. 0.34. So this would be considered non-significant, which is how the New England Journal more or less um, demanded that we report it that way. Now you could argue that perhaps the group with viability is behaving a little bit differently. Um, but this has also led to some more um, controversy about data like this, but uh, at least reported as not significant. Um, and so uh, what are the limitations of a viability study like that? Uh, it was pre-specified, which is always good, but randomization was not based on uh, the viability testing. So when you start looking at the, uh, the data as in the randomized group, since it's only one half of the patients in the trial actually had a viability test, it was pretty, pretty equal. 
but it wasn't perfect. And so the randomization criteria um, may not hold uh, who had a viability test versus who didn't get a viability test uh, and missing data like that. Um, so that only 50% of the enrolled patients had a viability test is, is uh, an, an issue for us. Uh, viability testing included SPECT or dobutamine echo, but didn't include the higher end test like PET or MRI. That's because your tax dollars funding the NIH uh, were not sufficient enough to allow those kind of, those kind of tests to be done. Um, so this was a federally funded trial. Uh, medical therapy was GMT, but that was GMT circa 2002. And what happens if you now start adding uh, MRAs and ARNI and SGLT2 inhibitors? Would you get to a better outcome with medical therapy? Um, great question. Uh, you have to redo the entire trial to figure that one out. In fact, there's other viability trials underway, which are automatically going to be um, uh, behind the hate ball because they have not included RNA or SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, and then finally, the uh, viability analysis, as we discussed, was forced by the uh, um, oversight committees that we had to specify in advance how we're going to define viability. So we weren't, weren't going to fit the data to match our outcome it was the other way around. You uh, define what, what, what's viable and what's not, and then examine the outcome that uh, falls out of that. So the medical therapy is an issue um, and the viability analysis is also an issue, but at least the medical therapy circa 2002 was good. So over 92% of patients got beta blockers, ACE inhibitors or ARBs, um, as well as aspirin and uh, statins. So medical therapy was pretty good for the way we were doing it back then. Okay, well, here's a continuous analysis. I, I, I told you we had also done just to get over the, the hump of this issue that we had uh, these pre-specified arbitrary cut points. So any extent of baseline viability is a percent of left ventricle is shown on the um, x-axis and the all-cause mortality is shown on the y-axis. There's a trend for lower mortality with cabbage, but you can see the confidence intervals overlap significantly. So there's, there's no significant difference here. Okay, um, but really what came out of the 10-year analysis for me was, was most interesting. And that is, does it really matter whether you improve the ejection fracture or not? We all started in this whole area by seeing these remarkable improvements in ejection fraction. If you could identify who had viable tissue and you revascularize it and the ventricle perks up and contracts more, vivid, uh, more avidly, um, does that, is that driving the outcome? Uh, Dr. Goldberger may say, well, how about the ventricular arrhythmias? What happens to them? You know, um, are there other factors here? And so uh, what we did was to look at these 10 year data in the people who had the viability tests to see whether um, uh, the change in ejection fraction differed, whether you had medical therapy or cabbage. And so it didn't matter whether you had medical therapy or cabbage. If you had viable myocardium, you had a higher increase in ejection fraction as you would anticipate. All those prior studies had shown that. Viable tissue will show an improvement in ejection fraction with revascularization, or you discuss the fact that beta blockers do that too, and they do it to a pretty similar extent. And on the left are the people without viability, which did not show as much of an improvement in ejection fraction, but most importantly was the overall survival. Uh, didn't matter whether your ejection fraction improved or not. Uh, the outcome was essentially the same with or without an improvement in ejection fraction. So uh, this surprised some people. Uh, it added to the mix of controversial issues about this particular clinical trial. Uh, for me, it, it just reiterated what we already knew because there was an earlier paper in a smaller series from Yale by some Samadhi and coworkers uh, looking at survival after cabbage in patients with LV dysfunction and whether or not uh, an increase or lack of increase in ejection fraction led to a better outcome. And you can see that the group with an increase in EF, whose EF went from 24% to 39%, um, had no better outcome than the individuals who had no, no increase in ejection fraction. So it, it, for me, this what this translates into, yeah, function is important. Uh, maybe these patients will have a better uh, quality of life if you make their ventricular function better. But in terms of survival, there's so many other things that can enter into um, um, whether patients uh, have uh, a better outcome in terms of survival, um, you know, related to uh, what's going to happen with the next uh, uh, coronary occlusion. 
you know, uh, even if you have uh, a lot of non-viable myocardium, if you're revascularizing the areas of a viable myocardium, and the next coronary occlusion may not be fatal. There may also be reduction in ventricular arrhythmias with revascularization too, which Dr. Goldberger could probably discuss much better than I could. And so uh, this, this finding was, that we found was just uh, something that had already been found 20 years earlier by Samadhi and coworkers. Um, and so uh, in context, uh, in patients with ischemic LV dysfunction, survival is not dependent on improvement in LV function. Um, now, so does that mean there's a role for viability testing? We still do this. Um, and many times uh, it's because the referring doctor like myself wants to know, and many times it's the person on the other end, like the surgeon or the uh, interventional cardiologist who wants to know, taking on a high-risk individual. Um, and so uh, I think it's alive and well. Vi viability testing does identify higher risk patients. Um, and those higher risk subgroups are associated with the outcome with evidence-based medical therapy and also the outcome of vascularization. Um, but it's not independently a predictor of survival benefit alone from revascularization. And, you know, especially in a clinical trial like I was part of, there's so many other factors that feed into overall survival, you know, age of the patient, who's got diabetes, what's the kidney function. So the, all these other clinical factors were actually the most important predictors of outcome. It wasn't so much whether they had viable myocardium or not. That's what we do clinically when we're trying to identify who might be a candidate for revascularization. It's not just viability, it's, it's the, the patient we're talking about, which has to be individualized. So viability testing shouldn't be considered a prerequisite for decisions regarding medical versus surgical management in patients with ischemic LV dysfunction. Um, so this is where I started having uh, uh, my friendly relationship became kind of a, a friendly debate with Dr. Delcizian, my uh, former mentee who became my mentor, because um, uh, he would still argue that it's really important. I would say, yeah, it's important, but it's not the only thing. Um, uh, Eric Velasquez, who was the uh, lead investigator of the CIS trial, and I had a review in Jack, <clears throat> which is now almost seven years old, where we made a list of the things that you would consider if you're going to uh, have a patient with uh, a bad LB function and uh, consider medical therapy versus uh, uh, cabbage plus medical therapy. Um, and uh, viability matters, but you can see all the other factors that are in there, you know, renal insufficiency, uh, the degree of remodeling, in fact, those, those were probably the most important things. Uh, patients, patients who had the, the worst ventricles actually had the best outcome. So they, had, they had the most to lose, but the most, most to gain with revascularization, especially if it's multivessel disease. And if you have a, a large degree of remodeling. So those were the factors that seemed to us to be much more important viability is there, but just not as important as the other issues. But um, stay tuned. I, I mentioned there are other trials underway. And um, um, there's this data also that uh, Greg Stone pointed out to me. Here's the data we saw earlier regarding uh, all-cause mortality. Same slide shown earlier. What happens if you look at cardiovascular mortality? This is a kind of all-comer uh, mortality rates. Uh, how about cardiovascular mortality? It's a little different. Uh, here we still see that, that the group on the right with viability uh, is showing a trend for a better outcome. We still see the hazard ratio, which uh, is well below 1.0 when you include the confidence intervals. And now the um, interaction p-value is 0.07. So it's getting kind, of, kind of close to being a significant finding. And uh, you know, pretty striking differences in survival, 52% versus 39%. And, and most importantly, if you just look at the group uh, getting um, cabbage, how cabbage is so much more significantly related to uh, survival if you have viable myocardium versus non-viable myocardium. Um, so that's uh, led to further debates and issues about how we do it and who should we do it uh, to or with. Uh, this state-of-the-art statement uh, that uh, I was engaged with uh, from the American Heart Association uh, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, again, I was, I was the one crying into the wind against all of these imaging experts about like, just you know, put the brakes on a little bit. We're, we're very interested in imaging, but um, we kind of look at the patients too. And uh, most recently, uh, Julio Panza, uh, 
um, and uh, Dr. Chernowski and I um, have a, another review in Jack, uh, where we tried to kind of make the point that, you know, viability still matters, but not, not in the classic sense, because the classic paradigm would be something like this. Does, does the patient have a substantial amount of viable myocardium, depending on what your threshold would be and which test you're using? And if the answer is uh, a no, you would not revascularize. And if it's yes, you would consider revascularization with the uh, uh, hope that you would improve LV systolic function, ameliorate heart failure, and have a, a better survival. Um, and again, that's probably not what we're seeing. Uh, so we uh, propose perhaps to just change the paradigm, make, make it a little bit different. Uh, yeah, viability testing still matters, but uh, it's, put this in context with uh, which vessels are you going to um, revascularize? Um, are, are the vessels themselves suitable for revascularization? Um, and um, uh, then tie your viability test with the coronary anatomy and the difficulty of the revascularization procedure itself, and then consider going forward. Uh, and so now we have a different uh, uh, criteria for who would get revascularized. And the idea would be you're gonna protect the viable segments you're not gonna make the non-viable segments better, but you're gonna protect the viable segments uh, against the next uh, coronary occlusion that might occur and could occur suddenly. And so you're gonna reduce the risk of MI and ventricular arrhythmias. And perhaps that's why there could be a, an increase in survival. Um, well, um, you'll notice I've been talking about cabbage all along. What we don't have is a good trial in patients of this degree of LB dysfunction comparing PCI versus cabbage either. If you, if you look at the data of cabbage versus PCI, you'll find essentially no trials in patients with LV dysfunction with an EF less than 35%. And so the data we do have, which is completely, mostly uh, uh, retrospective, many times single center studies would tend to favor cabbage over PCI, um, which is why we're saying cabbage. Um, uh, we, we could use a trial in this space too with PCI. So some of those trials are underway as we speak as well. Some of them have a viability component built into it. Um, so that's kind of where I've been as a uh, 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 investigator in this area. Um, um, it's uh, been interesting to see how it's evolved because I, I was assuming that the stitch trial was gonna be a positive trial. We identified the viable, viable patients, we vascularized them and bingo, uh, they would do so much better. And so I kind of fell out of favor with a lot of my colleagues on the imaging side um, along the way. Um, but that's kind of what it's like, you know, in, in, in academic medicine. You know, you make friends, you lose friends, you, uh, you uh, try to follow the data, try to follow the evidence. And, you know, this is not the first clinical trial to shoot down a hypothesis. There's all kinds of trials which have taken well-established norms and told us that perhaps they, that we now have a evidence base that would suggest otherwise. So anyway, um, that's um, what I thought I would discuss this evening. Keep it brief. You probably want to, yep, had a busy day. Probably have to get back and finish up your rounds, go have dinner, get home, see your family. So I didn't want to have a long drawn out that discussion tonight. Um, but uh, um, I'm glad we had a chance to go over these data, Jeff. So thanks for choosing that topic. <laughs> Right, so we have uh, obviously some time for uh, some thoughtful uh, discussion and questions for you. Um, let me uh, start with one. Um, I mean, the obvious question is, could it, not all viable myocardium is necessarily the same. I mean, there are many ways one could uh, even parse the viability questions. I mean, you know, looking at uh, whether the viable myocardium responds to revascularization or not. Um, looking at, for example, the duration of, of hibernation. I mean, it, does that affect the ability of that to recover? So how do you think those things will tie into this whole, uh, whole issue? Yeah, well, those are other uh, conundrums that we, we deal with. In fact, um, hibernation is difficult. Um, you know, stunning is a... Uh, uh, really easily studied in a laboratory with experimental models. Um, and so um, 
Um, in, in fact, it was an experimental model looking for a clinical example, and then the clinical example came along with uh, primary PCI. Uh, hibernation was a flip side of that. We had these patients with chronic LV dysfunction, and no one could ever develop a good model for that. And so what is hibernation? And so, so the in, initial um, definition of hibernation was that you had this chronic low flow state uh, leading to uh, LP dysfunction. And uh, that's difficult to replicate in a model. And in fact, people would argue myocardium can't do that, you know, because back to your, your duration issue. So the, uh, uh, the best model actually comes from John Canty at the University of Buffalo. And uh, it's kind of reset the paradigm of how we define hibernation. It's probably not true chronic low flow. It's probably not true hibernation. It's probably repetitive stunning. Where you have a stenosis, patient gets ischemic, gets a, a reversible a degree of LB dysfunction. And before that can improve back to normal, you get another episode when the patient's uh, active and exercising. So you have repetitive areas of, 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 of stunning. Um, but if you can uh, reverse that, then things will improve. Now he has, actually has done that with an excellent pig model. And he's shown with his pig model of these reversible episodes of ischemia leading to a kind of chronic Low flow, low flow and LB dysfunction state. And, and the finding is kind of the reverse of what you thought, that the, the low coronary flow of the resting additions is because the myocardium isn't working that hard, you know? And so your, your coronary uh, autoregulation has kicked in to supply the amount of fuel needed for this uh, less contractile myocardium. And he's done this with PET imaging and the vitamin echo and Alcom and, and arrhythmias as well. And, uh, uh, Got probably the one model that seems to replicate what you see with patients, uh, but you know that's clearly up for grabs as as to all the other factors you're, you're mentioning. Uh, and is it, is it is it single vessel disease or multi vessel disease? You have not only an area that may be hibernating, but you know the in the LAD territory, but the left circumflex area is also getting areas of reversible ischemia. You know, so it's a uh, it's, it's really complicated. That, that's why, I, 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 again, the most important thing we do is, okay, we, we take the data we have, uh, it's imperfect, um, which is not unusual in clinical medicine, even when you have clinical trials, and you try to apply that to your patient. So we, even the most perfect clinical trial may not, might not be always applicable to each individual patient. And then you try to just kind of tease out, you know, what, what's, what's, what's going on here and what should you do. So, you know, if you had a, a 56 year old man with new onset heart failure, tight LAD, good distal target. Okay, do we need a viability test? I know that we're gonna probably wanna open that artery. Um, we'll probably use PCI uh, and compare that instead to a uh, maybe a, a 78 year old woman who's already had a revascularization, has bypass grafts that are diseased um, and has poor distal targets. You know, those are two, two totally different patients for the different physiology you have to kind of determine you know okay will the viability test be helpful in her to determine whether it's worth a high risk intervention okay great so uh, one commercial message i'd like to really thank ebony carter for uh all the coordination uh to make this uh, event happen um she is holding a microphone for anybody who does want to ask a question, we do have a uh, whole following on uh, Zoom. So uh, we'll uh, have the microphone for those who have questions. I do have a question, Bob. Um, this is Mauricio Cohen here on Zoom. Can you hear me? Oh, we have somebody on Zoom. I, we can barely hear you. Okay. okay. Now we so, can hear you. Perfect. So the question is about, uh, so everything here is revascularization with cabbage because the, tri the stitch trial was based uh, on, on cabbage. So can you, I mean, we, we wrote the guidelines and we had a hard time uh, imputing uh, these data to revascularization in general because it's all cabbage and cabbage is different than, uh, than, 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 than PCI. PCI opens the vessel but does not make the vessel impervious to other uh, to other lesions that can rupture or, or cause uh, subsequent events. Can these be imputed? I mean, you, you mentioned PCI of the proximal LAD, but that can really can that really be assumed that way? Because this all this data is cabbage versus medical therapy. There's no PCI there. Uh, 
Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree. In fact, I hopefully made that point that uh, we, we need a good clinical trial with PCI versus, uh, versus cabbage. Uh, the existing data we have, uh, at least in my read of it, which is imperfect retrospective cohort studies, uh, would suggest that the outcome, when you have really bad LV function, where you, where you want to revascul have complete revascularization, less risk of uh, 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 secondary uh, uh, occlusion of, uh, of stents, um, maybe, maybe better with, with the cabbage, but that's just my personal personal interpretation of the data out there. But you're absolutely right. Writing a, writing a guideline on this is quite difficult because you're, if you're in a kind of a data-free zone. Yes. And, stitch, and Stitch, as I hope I pointed out, has a lot of warts associated with it. So that's... Yeah. And, and you know... And the, outside. the truth is that in reality, the surgeons will dodge a bullet of these patients and they will say... Oh no, it has to go for for PCI, and we end up with the you know the with the worst and the most difficult ones to revascularize, and that's the true in the practice. So it's it's just sure. interesting. No, and and that was probably also built into a randomized trial. You know, we we wanted to have a registry, so we could also follow all the patients who didn't get ran, randomized uh, at various centers, and look at them because they they may have been more uh, of the real patients um, because. Uh, clinical decision were maybe a little bit easier based upon the uh, substrate and the comorbidities that people were dealing with. So we didn't get a registry. Instead, we have patients who got enrolled in a clinical trial and that in and of itself could have a selection bias as to who gets randomized. So uh, uh, fully, fully agree. Um, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a work in progress, but it's also a work where we, we may never get the perfect clinical trial. We'll do the waiting for a patient. I, don't, I don't know if that's a good thing or bad thing. Thank you so much for the talk. It, it's really good and something that we bring up in clinical practice all the time. One of the things that I wonder is whether or not we're looking at the right thing with regards to revascularization. So you mentioned medical therapy and beta blockers specifically cause increases in ejection fraction. And are we looking at the right target? So epicardial coronary disease, or are we need to look more closely at microvascular coronary flow mm -hmm. and whether things like SGLT2 inhibitors and, and GLP-1 antagonists are really affecting that microvascular flow and what's the role of epicardial versus microvascular? Great question. <laughs> um, yeah, so current, I mean, uh, Dr. Goldberger and I had the uh, unique uh, opportunity to uh, work with Dr. Francis Clocky at Northwestern, he was chief of cardiology at the University of Buffalo and um, former president of the ACC. And he was a master in studying coronary physiology, macro and micro and uh, coronary flow reserve. I mean, things, things now that you know, we kind of take for granted and how we, term, how we even have terminology for these things. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's, you have to look at the resistance vessels as well as the capacitance vessels. And we all know that when you have a, a tight uh, lesion in the large artery, the microvascular behaves appropriately or inappropriately sometimes to try to restore flow or maintain flow. Yeah, really important. So th that may get into the, some of the issues. Okay, how, how about the patients with diabetes? Uh, how about the patients with hypertension? Uh, what, what are the other medical therapies these patients are getting You know, to cause... Uh, uh, downstream uh, vasodilation, et cetera. Great question. And so I think, you know, it's, it's obviously for the next generation, uh, great areas for uh, research. You know, we need, we need, we need more data. And so I, I don't, I don't have the answer. Maybe you, you've got some other, other literature you've seen, which may, may steer us in the right direction. It's a great question, but it's, 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 it's complex physiology. And then, and then you build in the other things that we talked about, you know, the patient, the age, the other uh, uh, aspects of that individual um, uh, that plays into our clinical decision-making, which is not perfect. Thank you so much. That was a great talk. And uh, I've had the pleasure to follow your career, I guess, because I've been reading your articles since uh, since way back since my fellowship. And um, this has been a topic I've been very interested in for many years. All viability is not equal. We know that, right? Is, is there anything that we can do to determine whether or not we sh other things that we can be looking at 
in terms of who will respond better as opposed to who won't. And I think that it's just a matter of defining that group, that subgroup, because it just doesn't make sense that they would not do better long-term and certainly much less in, or less incidence of things like heart failure, arrhythmias, et cetera. Yeah. Well, I think we're still struggling because, because of the complexity that we've already discussed. Um, and, uh, you know, so MRI is really helpful identifying scar. Um, the, the perfect MRI test would also look at uh, the non-scar tissue to see what's going on there in terms of its uh, uh, substrate and its uh, uh, whether or not there's inducible ischemia in those territories as well. Um, it's it's a, it's, a, it's an, these are all open questions. So uh, I don't have the I don't have the perfect answer. Um, I do remember when Dr. McCarthy joined us from Cleveland. You know, he was disappointed that we didn't have a, a PET scanner. And, uh, you know, I was trying to say, well, okay, it, it'd be good if we do, if we did, and, and, and now we do. Um, but, um, and, and PET certainly has evolved too. So I, I think, you know, some of the uh, higher order uh, imaging tests that one could employ right now, but it's expensive and you can't do a PET scan in everyone. Um, either, you know, it's, it's not available or it's too expensive or insurance is not gonna cover it. Um, and, uh, uh, I'm not sure it's better than necessarily. The butamine echo is quite good at looking at the, what, where, where the contractile reserve is. Um, and uh, we used to get in these debates between the nuclear people and the echocardiographers, and we stopped debating because these, these tests all work sometimes synchronously. You know, sometimes you want to know a little, a little bit of each. Um, um, again, where you know, MRI could be useful because you can look at ischemia, you could also look at contractile reserve blood flow along the way. But again, those are you know expensive and not readily available. It requires the army of te uh, technologists to help you help you do it. So there's, there's no simple algorithm that seems to work other than good horse sense. So. Hi, Scott, I'm, I need to call you back. Can I call you back? Okay, thank you. Would be really important to our um, thanks, Dr. Bono. Um, that was an excellent lecture, and I really appreciate it. Um, and I, I like, you know, how you kind of discussed all the data, and then at the end said, "Well, there's a paucity of data still." To, you know, and there, you know, you gave a couple examples where we still have to use clinical judgment, you know, and the art of medicine, and you know, um, in, in the paucity of some of this data, um, and we still have to make some decisions. Um, Looking forward into the next, you know, the next um, trials, I mean, you alluded to upcoming, you know, per, uh, uh, PCI trials looking at revascularization in this patient population. And, you know, looking at the, some of the data, you know, in the, the post or the bypass patients, you know, how long do you think that follow up is going to have to be? It's going to have to be a 10 year trial to show some data. And yeah. should all the all cause mortality really be the, the primary outcome or is car perhaps cardiovascular mortality the, the you know, the, the true outcome we're looking at here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, great, great questions, Carlos. Um, yeah, if, if, if a five-year trial is negative, but you send it to 10 years and it's positive, only because you followed the patients longer and the hazard ratio really changed a little bit. Um, uh, in fact, the, the Carrie Lee, the uh, DCRI statistician, predicted that would happen. You know, you know, he said, okay, let's follow the patients longer. It'll become positive. But the, the, the overall event rates is going to probably stay the same in your Hazard ratio is not going to change at all. So yeah, if it takes ten years to show a benefit, that's probably not enough. You you, you want to be able to show a benefit in the first couple of years. Um, and of course, when you do cabbage, getting back to the whole question about cabbage, there's an immediate hit. The patients that get the cabbage have a much higher, you know, thirty day mortality, and the patients treated medically. And you saw that you saw that with uh, with Stitch. There's a, a thirty first three to six months was worse with cabbage, and then the courage diverged diverted in the other direction. Um, there's an interesting study from the uh, Cleveland Clinic, which I didn't show because I just tend to torpedo it when I do, is that you have to read the methods really carefully. Uh, and, and you look at the data, it was, a, it was a cabbage versus medical therapy and showing that viability testing was really important at predicting who was gonna uh, do better uh, with cabbage and uh, cabbage was overall better. Um, I look at the curves and there was no early 
30 day mortality with cabbage. So I read the methods and they, they actually only started the clock at 90 days, you know? So uh, claim, claiming was related to the referral biases and everything else, but it was also excluded the third, the, all the early mortality. So um, that's where, you know, a PCI trial would be quite interesting, but then you get into this whole issue about whether you can you know, do a com you know, true completely fast, whether you're treating the lesion, you're not, you're not actually restoring all, all the downstream downstream blood flow beyond the all the secondary stenosis um, but uh, yeah great great degree of continuing interest in this field and continuing uncertainty hi sir i'm azar cardiology fellow uh, how do you see the future of petamar uh, considering including both function and anatomy yeah um, great question, or, or, or even PET-CT, if it's just the anatomy, but of course MRI gives you more because you can look at the degree of uh, uh, both uh, uh, condensed fibrosis as well as interstitial changes as well. So I think PET-MRI would be really exciting. Uh, we do that, but we don't do it as a single test. Uh, so we do a PET and we do an MRI and we try to, we try to then merge the images, which is not ideal. Nice to, nice to do it you know, in a single setting. Um, so I, I think it's got great potential. Uh, the question again is, okay, it'll be, it'll be a great research study. And then is that gonna be applicable to you know, all the thousands of patients where the, the data you get from those research studies would be, would be then applied? It'd be hard to uh, implement that you know, across the nation. I mean, we have to deal with all the other you know, healthcare issues, which we don't have to get into right now, and, and, and budgetary uh, items as well. And we see that with clinical trials with medical therapy for heart failure. You know, uh, clearly we, we, we know that uh, these newer drugs work, they're very expensive, the cost effective analyses show that they're actually cost effective. But okay, so that drug is cost effective, but what happens when you then throw that into the mix of all the other things we need to do in a healthcare system to keep it afloat? You know, and can, even though it's a cost-effective medicine, it's still expensive. So it, same thing would go, I think, would apply to PET MRI. Be a great tool. Um, I, I'm not aware of a whole lot of data in, in this space using that. Um, and of course, you know, PET would give you blood flow and presumably metabolism as well. And of course, uh, I'm impressed we uh, have recruited successfully a very good nuclear cardiologist, uh, Richard Weinberg from uh, Michigan, and he's just turning our head our heads around because he's showing what PET can do. You know, he get gated PET, he can get, get function. You know, um, and uh, quantify blood flow, not just not just a qualitative visual analysis, but true quantitation of epicardial versus endocardial blood flow. It's, it's spectacular. You know, and you combine that by itself or with MRI, you can really get a lot of bang for your buck in terms of identifying what's going on with that patient. So uh, without knowing what your capabilities are here in Miami, uh, we could do that uh, as, a, as a research study, but I'm not, I'm not sure how we're going to afford to do that as a, as a clinical uh, 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 pathway. Okay. Other, other questions? All right, so... Um... I will thank again, Dr. Bono, for, uh, for joining us for today. And uh, tomorrow we have an exciting uh, day, starting with uh, Cardiology Grand Rounds at 7.30 in the morning here uh, for all of you here and all of you in the, uh, in the cloud. Um, and uh, everybody should have received the schedule for the rest of the day as well uh, by email. So uh, we're looking forward uh, to a, a really productive visit and the uh, reinvigoration of our academic lives. Uh, so thank you. Thank you to our speaker and thank you to our Zoom listeners. This session is over. Have a good day.